we're analyzing Union Pacific stock ticker UNP to see if it's a great business on sale. We're using the Select 6 analysis to look at the most telling financial metrics before estimating an intrinsic value for Union Pacific. Then we're giving a final rating to the business. There will be a key bonus metric along the way that just might be the tipping point when analyzing Union Pacific for your stock portfolio. Before we get into these valuable metrics, let's understand Union Pacific stock performance. Right now, Union Pacific trades for $205.92 per share. Year to date, their stock price is down just 1%. They're pretty much flat. In the last five years, Union Pacific stock price is compounding at 7% annually. They're up 40% overall. In the last 10 years, their stock price is compounding at just under 10% annually. Going back prior to the global financial crisis, Union Pacific stock price is compounding at 15% annually. The company's stock is up more than 13 times. They're one of the top performing stocks of the last two decades. Right now, Union Pacific also pays a 2.56% dividend yield. This is above average. Their average dividend yield throughout this time is in addition to their returns in their stock price. Union Pacific trades about $20 above their 52-week low. The company is down nearly $40 from their 52-week high. A little under 1% of their shares are sold short. Union Pacific is a big business. They have a nearly $124 billion market cap. But the burning question is, why should we be paying close attention to Union Pacific? Omaha, Nebraska-based Union Pacific is the largest public railroad in North America, operating on more than 30,000 miles of track in the western two-thirds of the United States. States. Union Pacific generated $25 billion of revenue in 2022 by hauling coal, industrial products, intermodal containers, agricultural goods, chemicals, and automotive goods. Union Pacific owns about one-fourth of Mexican railroad Ferromex and derives roughly 10% of its revenue hauling freight to and from Mexico. Union Pacific can trace its roots all the way back to 1862. With that background about the business, let's get into the numbers. Starting with metric number one, we want their average return on capital in the last five years to be above 14%. A typical business earns about a 7% return on capital. Looking for a benchmark that's double this allows us to build in margin of safety based off the quality of the business. Union Pacific earns very stable and very steady returns on capital. They hit a low of 13.5% in 2020. In their most recent fiscal year, they earned 16.5%. Averaged out over this time, Union Pacific earns 15.3% returns on capital in a given year. That's a point above the benchmark we're looking for, meaning this is a check starting things off on metric number one. Metric number two, we're looking for growth to go with those returns on capital. We want to see five-year growth in their revenues, earnings, and free cash flows. This metric's all or nothing. All three of these have to be up for this to be a check. We'll also be including their numbers up until today. In this time, Union Pacific has grown their revenues by 10%. Their earnings have grown by 17%. Their free cash flows are slightly up. They've grown by 3%. This is growth across the board here for Union Pacific. Another check on metric number two. Metric number three, we're looking for earnings per share growth in the last five years. This looks at Union Pacific on a per share basis. It's what an individual shareholder could expect from the business. In this time, not only did Union Pacific grow their earnings by 17%, the companies also bought back 18% of their shares in just five years. These are big buybacks for such an old and established business. Their earnings per share have grown very quickly in this time, and they've earned high returns on capital throughout. This is a big check on metric number three. Union Pacific might be an uber cannibal in the making, especially if it continues to buy back shares like they have during this time. Metric number four, we're looking for free cash flow per share growth in the last five years. Again, with slight growth in their free cash flows and these big 18% share buybacks, this is another check here on metric number four. Union Pacific has grown their free cash flows per share over this time. Recapping where we stand currently, through four metrics, we are a perfect four for four for Union Pacific. But there's still one vital piece missing. You might think nailing returns on capital and having good growth is the key, but we haven't touched on the one thing that I believe sets truly wonderful businesses apart, which is having these characteristics without using a lot of debt. In metric number five, we want their net debt, which is their total debt minus their cash and their short-term investments, to be below the amount of free cash flow Union Pacific has produced in their last five years. During this time, the company has increased their net debt position. They ended their most recent fiscal year with about $34 billion in net 
net debt. Right now, they have about $34.2 billion of net debt, so they've continued adding on to this. And in this time, Union Pacific has produced just under $28 billion worth of free cash flow. While in absolute terms, that's a lot that's coming in just below the company's net debt position, meaning this is an X on metric number five. This might not be that much of an issue for Union Pacific, especially when we look at it compared to other businesses. They have a very established and durable business that functions like a semi-regulated utility. With their large amount of fixed assets, it's likely a good thing that they're employing some debt in their business. Again, while this isn't fully supported by their free cash flows, you'd want to dig in and look at their debt profile in more detail to see if this could cause any issues for the business. Before we get to the first of two different ways we'll be estimating a value for Union Pacific, it's time for our bonus. As our bonus, we're looking at Union Pacific's dividend profile. Right now, Union Pacific pays an above average 2.56% dividend yield, which is above the dividend yield you'd receive from an S&P 500 ETF. For Union Pacific, we want their dividends to be supported by their free cash flows. That's been the case in all five of these years. Union Pacific has not only grown their free cash flows per share, they've also grown their dividends per share, and it looks like they maintained a reasonable dividend payout ratio throughout this time. While this is a snapshot of their last five years of performance, and it's no guarantee for the future, Union Pacific's dividend looks to be well supported by their free cash flows, and it looks like it's in pretty good shape. The big metric of them all, metric number six, we want Union Pacific's average five-year free cash flow to their total enterprise value to give us a yield that's above 5%. If this is the case, this gives a slight risk premium to the yield of the 10-year treasury. It's the first of two different ways we'll be using to value Union Pacific. Right now, Union Pacific has a big $158 billion enterprise value. This accounts for both their market cap and their net debt position. It gives a view of Union Pacific similar to it being a private business. In their last five years, we learned the company produced just under $28 billion worth of free cash flow, meaning in an average year, they produced just under $5.6 billion of free cash flow. When we divide that by their $158 billion enterprise value, we get about a 3.5% average free cash flow to enterprise value yield for Union Pacific. On a current basis, the company produced $5.4 billion of free cash flow in their last 12 months. When that's divided by their enterprise value, we get about a 3.4% current free cash flow to enterprise value yield for the company. Both of those are about in line with the yield of the 10-year treasury. However, they're down from the risk premium we'd be seeking, meaning this is an X on metric number six. Don't just throw Union Pacific out. We still want to come to a more concrete estimate of a fair value per share for the business. Everything we've discussed so far is important, but there's something missing that in my opinion is the main reason to analyze Union Pacific, which takes us on to using a discounted cash flow model to come to an estimate of their fair value per share. A DCF model is based off the predictability of a company's free cash flows. Like any model in any discipline, its outputs are sensitive to its inputs. Union Pacific has been a pretty predictable business in their past. We're starting with an average of their free cash flows from their three most recent fiscal years, then using historical assumptions to grow these into the future. It's up to you to figure out if these assumptions will be accurate or not for the business. Assuming Union Pacific grows their average three-year free cash flows at 7% for the next 10 years, then assuming that growth rate falls to 5% for the following decade, if we add in the company's tangible book value, which gives an estimate of their net worth, if we're seeking a 15% rate of return, which is the rate of return Warren Buffett's looking for in addition to his margin of safety requirements, at today's valuations, it looks like an estimate of Union Pacific's fair value per share is just under $108. That's down about $80 from the company's current stock price. There are some key points to be mindful of. Union Pacific has had a high degree of business predictability in their past. Given the nature of their business, it's likely this could continue, although that may not be certain. This discount rate is an estimate of total returns to shareholders based off their free cash flows. It would already be including the company's dividend yield, so their stock price would not be appreciating by that full 15%. Also, the company's tangible book value may be materially understated due to how the accounting is done for their share buybacks. As Union Pacific has bought back a lot of their shares in recent years, it could look like the company's net worth is lower than it actually is, especially if we're looking at a replacement cost value for the business. Most importantly, this analysis is not financial advice. It's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. Consult with the financial advisor before making any investment decision. In just a minute, we'll talk about our final rating for Union Pacific, but we have to address something first. We've covered the numbers. But the qualitative aspects of this business are just as important. What are they? 
starting with the qualitative points supporting a potential long thesis. Number one, compared with trucking, shipping by rail is less expensive for long distances and is four times more fuel efficient per ton mile. These factors should help support longer term incremental intermodal growth. Number two, precision scheduled railroading efforts yielded impressive improvements in Union Pacific's operating ratio, which is expenses divided by revenue between 2019 and 2021. Despite service setbacks in 2022, it's expected Union Pacific will continue to refine its precision scheduled railroading playbook in the years ahead. Number three, network service levels are gradually improving off of a lackluster performance in 2021 and much of 2022, thanks to progress hiring train and engine personnel. We'd be remiss if we didn't cover the negative aspects of the business as well. Looking at the key points supporting a potential short thesis, number one, the Surface Transportation Board oversees railroads pricing, so there will always be underlying risk of re-regulation in terms of a policy shift to a more heavy-handed approach. Number two, terminal congestion may be easing, but normalized rates in the competing truckload sector and sluggish retail sector restocking will likely temper intermodal demand in 2023. Number three, muted volume growth and significant wage inflation from the new labor contract will make operating ratio improvement more challenging in 2023, despite recovering network fluidity. There you have it for a balanced perspective of some of the qualitative aspects of Union Pacific. Now it's time to give our rating. In analyzing Union Pacific, stock ticker UNP, we learn the company operates like a semi-regulated utility. Union Pacific's other major competitor, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, or BNSF, is fully owned by Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. He purchased BNSF just after the global financial crisis and has held it ever since, viewing it as one of Berkshire's crown jewels, which he said will still be important for America 100 years from now. It earns stable, above-average returns on capital in the mid-teens. Union Pacific has grown its business in the last five years, also buying back 18% of their shares, which are huge buybacks. They've focused a lot on returning capital to shareholders through their buybacks and their above-average dividend yield. However, the company's free cash flows don't totally support their current net debt position due to the high amount of fixed assets they have in the business and both their durability and limited competition. This may or may not be a concern and likely still puts them in a better position than many other types of businesses. It's worth reiterating this analysis is not financial advice. Looking at the company's free cash flow to enterprise value yields, those are about in line with the yield of the 10-year treasury, but below the risk premium we'd be looking for. When we performed our discounted cash flow analysis, from today's valuations, if you believe those assumptions and are seeking a 15% rate of return, an estimate of Union Pacific's fair value per share is around $108. The company was last at those levels toward the end of summer 2017. You'd want to be patient as you further research the business. Looking at all the factors of our analysis, Union Pacific looks like a strong candidate for further research. They have some of the characteristics of being a great business, even if their valuation may not quite be where we want it to be. This isn't a buy or sell recommendation of any security. Consult with a financial advisor before making any investment decision. If you enjoyed today's video, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for more stock analysis videos, share your thoughts thoughts about Union Pacific and let me know what business you want me to look at next in the comments below. Thanks for learning about Union Pacific with me and have a great day.